Hey guys, it's Kate and Meredith with 101, a podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so excited to be here with Maureen Ryan. Maureen has a new book out. Maureen, thank you so much for joining us. You're a little bit different than most of the guests that we've had. So I would love for you to tell our listeners what your background is. I always love reading and writing. And so I went to journalism school that whole time I was freelancing and stuff. So I've really been writing um, in some form or another since, you know, since the 90s, early 90s, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. And so I ended up at the Chicago Tribune and it was just such an incredible time to be writing about pop culture, which was kind of mainly my beat. But I ended up being drawn to television when I began writing more about popular culture, you know, it was TV, film, photography, art exhibits, all things. But like TV was so incredible. I just remember that first summer, like CBS was like, hey, is this the thing called Survivor? And then everyone was like, oh my God, this is insane. So I began writing more and more about TV because, you know, Battlestar Galactica came out and The Sopranos and Sex and the City were going strong. So um, around that time, like the mid aughts, I became a full time TV critic. I was at the Chicago Tribune for a long time. Then I went to Huffington Post, was there for about five years. And then I went to Variety, where I was the chief TV critic for a few years. And since that time, I've been um, contributing all over the map. But uh, at the moment, I'm a contributing editor at Vanity Fair. As you know, my first book came out this year, um, Burn It Down. And The very short elevator pitch of why I felt that book was necessary was there have been reckonings in Hollywood on misogyny, assault, exploitation, racism, sexism, transphobia. But I really, really feel that what Hollywood has been good at for 100 years is like opening the door and saying, well, there's a problem in there and then going, and we're just going to close that door again. (laughs) Okay. well, we opened the door, so we fixed it. Right. I'm like, did. Did we though? I don't think we did. You know, when Me Too broke, I had been covering the industry for a long time. I had a number of contacts. I was working for mainstream outlets that, you know, um, had some pull in the industry or had some platform, you know, amongst industry professionals and even the public. So I began doing a lot of stories about exploitation and abuse in Hollywood. And if I may just digress for a moment, I want to get into the meat of whatever you want to ask me. But absolutely, the stories that I wrote had to do with abuse and sadism even you know and horrible work environments there's always the stories of people who are like well you have to be here till the boss leaves at like two in the morning or 10 p.m and you know the industry has often made the hours just simply the hours you're expected to be at work ridiculous and we've just accepted these things that you take them for granted the pay is terrible I think one of the big things I've been doing, especially the last six years, almost exactly, we're almost, we're coming up on the six year anniversary of Me Too, is demystify the industry, which is what you're doing as well. Let's demystify it. Let's not say it's full of only um, terrible people who want to do terrible things. That's not true at all. Like a lot of my favorite people in the whole world are in Hollywood. There's very little incentive to speak out about what's wrong about the industry. And so you essentially have a lot of people, even if they may be in the same workplace, feel afraid of even bringing it up to each other. And what happens at these workplaces is oftentimes people who all had to grin and bear it together, but kind of in these separate silos Mm -hmm. of pain, as I call them, they, they figure out that it wasn't just them and they weren't just being ungrateful. They were being gaslit and abused and no one felt they could speak out. The power differentials in the industry are almost absolute. And what people find it hard to believe is that, are you telling me of the 400 other people associated with that production, none of them have power? And effectively, the answer is no. Mm-hmm. And that's what's so weird. It's like Hollywood has built this image for itself is like, we're all in this sharing and caring place and we're all like respecting this that and the other when as you know it can be absolutely brutal including physically brutal if you have done you know five 14 hour days in a row and then you get in a car accident driving home you get blamed for it one of the things that meredith and i have been talking about is this idea that not only are people not valuable to a team, but they're also wildly 
replaceable. Oh, <laughs> and, disposable. You know, that, you know, there yes. are 10 more of you who would be grateful to be treated this way, you know, to have this opportunity oh, yeah. to have a thick skin, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, you're well, right. Are you like all the other people who would kill for this opportunity? And it's yeah. like, there's one thing I want to kill with fire, hence the name of my book, the lucky to be here, you know, ethos that is drilled into people. Yeah, I mean, most people worked their butts off, including some Nepo babies like that work hard. You know, I don't think that if your mom was like a jobbing actor in the 90s, I don't like and is now like a host at a restaurant. I don't think everyone is the same level of Nepo baby. Let me like be clear about that. There are people who have connections in the industry who didn't necessarily skate through on them. You know, I signed the book contract in 2021 going, well, like, I hope people are interested in the issue of exploitation. Well, I'm like, well, two guilds are on strike. I think my book is uh, perhaps possibly relevant. You know, why are people so fed up? Exhibit A. You know? Yeah, the, the fear-driven uh, way that this industry is run in some cases in some companies or corporations but um like I learned about being blacklisted when I was just starting out and That's the fact that I learned that term was just like it's a real thing thank god you brought that up because I think that the idea that people could be blacklisted in this day and age I think it's hard for civilians to wrap their head around but I absolutely, as I'm sure you do, I know of people who were literally told, like people would go around to executives, studio personnel, and and badmouth someone with lies. And that stuff has currency. I talk about Sleepy Hollow in my book. If you want to talk about a textbook case of what I'm talking about, if enough established people repeat the rumor it becomes a self-generating thing that people accept as gospel. And I cannot tell you the number of rumors that I've come across that I absolutely and fully know to be false, that people are 100% wedded to. They believe it completely. I was just going to say, like, it's so easy for someone to say, oh, she's very difficult. And like, it's it's just this understood, like, oh. A lot of people don't want to confront things. And it's easier to not confront things. And if things have been rigged in your favor, whoever you are, it's really, really easy and more comforting to just believe the narrative that doesn't make you look bad. I had to look at what did I reinforce? A lot of critics of my generation, we moved away to some degree from actors as the focus of our serious coverage, if you will. I understand why we did that. We began to see that like, oh, the architecture of this story is really interesting and it's ambitious in a different way. Let's talk to the showrunners. And so I think what got smuggled into that understandably, because in many cases we cared about these shows and championed these shows, is that we transferred the kind of hero worship that you see in celebrity coverage over to TV auteurs or, you know what I mean, and, you know, TV creators and so forth. And again, there were serious examinations of these men's work. Usually it was men, of course. And also critiques. Like, I don't, I didn't go through the entire era of, you know, peak TV of the aughts saying every one of these shows is 100% great. I was constantly writing about misuse of sexual violence. I was constantly writing about stereotypes and the blind spots that if you have an industry that is 95% cisgender white men, right is straight white men writing the industry you are going to see these blind spots so often that they're going to become like just engraved in your brain ultimately and i don't have an answer to this and maybe you guys can give me the answer you can't go through life never giving anyone the, the benefit of the doubt that's a terrible headspace to live in but i also think more consequentially studios networks executives covered for anyone who they thought could make them money get them awards get them press like there was just a concerted effort to disappear anything that d detracted from the narrative that this is a great genius show and a great genius person and venerate them and all that. So a lot of us have been disillusioned in the last, you know, several years. I think that was necessary. It's also painful. But hopefully what comes from that is, you know, frankly, what we're seeing now with these strikes, a clear eyed statement of fact, which is these are professionals doing jobs for money. They want to be paid fairly for their time, effort and their level of craft. 
These are not wild or insane things to ask for. 87% of SAG actors don't make the bare minimum to get health care, which is 26 grand in SAG covered work yeah. in a year. Right. If you can find me anyone who can live in LA on 26 grand a year, I mean, it's not possible. I don't think. If, if you live like three hours from LA under, you know, a tree, maybe, you know, I don't know. <laughs> not even 10 years ago, could you have afforded that in New York City? Exactly right. I mean, you know, every so often employers would be like, we should come out and live in LA. I'm like, <laughs> Every time I turn around, the housing prices have doubled there. And so I've watched what assistants were making in 2002. People were realizing in 2022 or 2021, they're making dollar for dollar the same amount or maybe 50 bucks more a week. That's not livable. There's a part in your book that really jumped out to me. And it was this idea of like a multi, multi-millionaire being in a room with someone who's a PA who is barely able to feed themselves based on their salary. I don't want to gloss over because I think it's so important to really illustrate what is wrong with the industry. And, you know, of the many, many problems, like there's just this utter disconnect of ability to survive. And, you know, you have these people that are working for nothing who should be grateful for these opportunities. They're sitting next to these people. And, you know, everything that goes along with that, where it's like this person is being mistreated, this person is not able to pay their bills or eat, you know, is expected to be there 18 hours a day. I feel like that is one of the things that really jumped out at me from your book, if you wanted to talk a little bit about that and just kind of, you know, expand upon that. I'm so glad you brought that up. The first time I wrote a formulation of a sentence like that was right after Me Too broke. And I've been banging that drum for years, which is there are other industries where people make a lot of money. There's Wall Street, Silicon Valley, DC. If you walk into an investment bank on Wall Street, the assistant to the CEO is probably making mid six figures. And I'm not saying that there aren't these wide disparities. In DC, yeah, there are lobbyists and whatnot that make a lot of money, but people around them maybe are making decent money too. Where in the world do you find someone making literally minimum wage in LA, $15, $16 an hour, and they are mm -hmm. bringing coffee that has to be the right temperature to someone who's worth a hundred million dollars? That is a power that everyone's aware of. And like so many things in the industry, people have danced around that reality and not confronted it head on. And this is my role to be annoying in culture and say, no, we got to talk about it. We got to talk about the fact that this person is going to steal power bars and that's going to be her dinner. And she is living with six roommates and has only a futon to her name. And she knows that if she does not present a picture of gratitude and enthusiasm and energy 24 seven, literally in some cases, she will be replaced tomorrow and will have no paycheck this week and will be homeless and living in her car or crashing on a couch in a month. Good people in the industry assume, well, I would never take advantage of that situation. I mean, great, cool. What are the guardrails present for those who will take advantage of that situation. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a millionaire. It could be the head of the camera department is also a big wig in his guild and has a lot of connections and could get you your next gig. That person can either help you get your next job or stay on this long running show where you could, you know, maybe buy a house two years from now if you stay on or get you blacklisted. You know, people have power in different parts of the industry and their little corner can be way up here and it can just be power over these eight people in post, power over these 10 writers in the room. The only guardrails that exist is going to the press. Really? Realistically? Because how many times? I mean, yeah, people go go to the cops sometimes. What did we see happen when one of Les Moonves' alleged victims went to the cops? One of the cops reached out to CBS executives, and they all worked, according to Attorney General Letitia James of New York, they all worked to cover up the entire situation. It's not just that there's you know, no guardrails. If you want to take an action to change that potentially or actually exploitative dynamic or abusive dynamic, what are your options? Again, people have come forward in Hollywood. It's not like no one ever told the truth, right? 
Yeah. It's often been framed as like, oh, you'll never eat lunch in this town again. And like, oh, I, here's how I made it in my biography or whatever. One thing I've highlighted a lot in my work is people just leave the industry. And that's not because they're bad at what they do. It's not because they're millennials and they want to lay down all day and eat avocado toast. It's not that. <laughs> It's because they fear for their physical safety, they fear for their mental health, and they don't have any money in the bank. And they're sick of being exploited despite working really, really hard. And this applies to more than film and TV, as you well know. Paying your dues in some kind of creative industry, we all know what that's code for. Now, first of all, I believe people should learn their craft. If you want to become a film editor, learn from the best. Be a student. The best people in this industry are students their whole lives. They're always learning. Paying your dues is often code for something else. And, you know, one thing I like to cite that is like the least sexy thing to ever cite is a study on the EEOC website, which I don't, you know, I read when it came out like years ago, it was 2016. It's basically fairly dry bureaucratic study from the Equal Opportunity Office of what are the conditions under which harassment and abuse happen? And it lays out six conditions. Is there someone who's considered a rainmaker? Are they considered untouchable? Are there many other people who have no status and no tools with which to fight back? There were all these conditions. I'm like, well, just described mm -hmm. Hollywood. Okay, <laughs> this feels bad. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There, are, like, it's like it's known how these situations, these exploitative situations, are created and not just created, but protected, nurtured, and yeah. continued. Some of the things that you've outlined in your book as well is like, you know, it's gotten even harder for people to move up the ladder. One of the reasons is the the lack of apprenticeships, you know, that used to be the case. The residuals no longer pay out as much. Offering up ideas with no compensation. I, I had a job uh, that was like, basically to interview for the job, you had to edit something. And I was like, okay, they're basically asking all these editors to edit something, give them their ideas, and then not hire you and utilize your ideas. Shit like that is something that is a no-no for me. Also, working on multiple projects at once is like something that has become the norm because you don't know where to put your balls into. You, you got to spread your balls out into different baskets or else, you know, who knows what's going to happen. And then obviously having that thick skin, right? These are all things that you've talked about in your book that really resonated with me. And it's just gotten harder and harder for, for people to, to move up. So like, what advice might you have for people that might have to go through those situations? You know, forewarned is forearmed and understand that for your safety and for your future, you might need to leave if it's, or you might need to pivot. People make twists and turns in their careers for many reasons. We've probably all been in situations where whether you have someone negotiating for you or you, like you just say no. No, I won't do that. Okay, cool. And then they come back and they actually meet your demands. If you can be part of a guild, be part of a guild. It can be hard to make friends in Hollywood, but you you know, if you move to LA or New York and you want to be part of these communities, find allies, find friends, listen to your gut. Like really listen to your gut and listen to your heart. If something feels wrong to you, listen to it. Even if you can't change it immediately, bounce your ideas and your thoughts off people you trust. Have people and ideally organizations that will have your back. Educate yourself on the hotlines that women in film has, the hotlines that mm -hmm. pay up Hollywood. You know, like there are advocacy organizations there are guild hotlines, and I'm not saying they will fix things necessarily, but know that there are ways out and you might need to find them. The only person who's going to stick up for you is you. And at times you will need help to make that sticking up for yourself work. You know, something I said, I really love the Screaming Into the Hollywood Abyss podcast. Um, I highly recommend, you know, listening to podcasts like that, like Children of Ten Do, this one. Educate mm -hmm. yourself from professionals who are putting out podcasts and in, in, in essays and whatnot, their own scripts. A lot of people put their scripts online and say, you can learn from my script for this film or this whatever. One thing I said on Screaming Into the Hollywood Abyss is never ever accept the idea that might be put forward to you that you have to earn basic human respect and basic decent treatment. No, you walk in the door on day one and you should have those things because guess what? You are a human being. That is a thing that I think is changing. And I, you know, sometimes I sit there and I go, 
I think a lot of this dialogue around the millennials and the young, they're so old. I'm like, look, I'm an old, like, I'll admit it. I think people of your generation, I learn from you. I have had the great fortune to meet people who set boundaries in ways that I didn't when I was coming up in journalism. I think what's happening now is that there's a mismatch between some old school, especially old school industry bosses who are like, well, when I was coming up, every day you got punched in the face and that was just a fun thing that we did. It's like, that was wrong. No, you don't. No, that's not okay. I mean, here's just one example. My former colleague at Variety, a reporter named Dan Holloway, he wrote a story, a series of stories that I think were so important. And they were about the DP, a longtime DP on Criminal Minds. And the DP and the crew, they're there all the time. And if there's someone there who's terrible, oof, yeah. things got so bad on Criminal Minds that they, uh, the crew actually went to like the California legal authorities and like there was complaints and there was a whole thing. It took a year or two, I think, maybe even a few years, but they, it, it, it somehow resolved in like, I believe Disney, which produced the show and then CBS aired it. There was some amount of entities that had to like pay a fine. There's just been this attitude in the industry that you shouldn't have boundaries. You shouldn't have a life outside work. You shouldn't ask mm-hmm. for things. You shouldn't get paid because you're lucky to be here. And isn't it great that you're working on a Marvel? You know, no, it's not great if you're working on some cool piece of ip but it's 4 a.m and they just put through another round of notes you got to change everything you just did because nobody can make up their mind no, yeah it's not fun and cool it's not oh, yeah. no it's a job and it should be treated like a job it's not like wow we're going to this cool fun cocktail party and just gonna like do lightsaber stuff all day and have fun and write about you know write stories for elves and you know lawyers and all that. it's like there can be creativity There can be wonderful artistry collaborations that produce something that for you as a creative person fills your soul. Like there's so many good things and good people in the industry. I I feel like there's like kind of a weird cross-generational conversation which is happening. I actually think the people who are sort of more in my age range are grappling with this idea quite seriously. I was being abused and I didn't really understand that that's what was happening. Or I was in a damaging work environment and I was being exploited. And people come to me with things that they wish they had done differently. And I, I certainly think about things I wish I'd done differently. So there are some people who are willing to like alter their worldview and alter with the times. But there is, as I'm sure you both know, there's still some people who are very wedded to the old school system. And I think in the old school norms... And I think some of that's just fear. Meredith and I approach women in the industry a lot to to invite them onto the podcast and talk about, you know, being a female in the industry and th- things like that. And there are two camps. There, there, there are the women who are like, yes, we need to change things. This is wrong. This is wrong. And then there's a whole other camp of women that are like, well, you know, this is what I endured. So there, it's just the way it is. I've watched people's careers prosper by attaching themselves to, shall we say, highly problematic individuals. I mean, that's, that's the rub. That's the, I mean, it's, it's, it's a true thing. You can have a career that prospers by going along with the worst stuff that the industry can do and does do. Where do I place the blame? And a reason to write a 400 page book is that that's a complicated answer. Where I feel more comfortable being rigorous in my examination of these dynamics is examining who has the most power. What studio is enabling that actor to like literally physically abuse people, like hit them? Some of the stories in your book, I I couldn't believe they were real, like devastating. It makes me nuts, this industry sometimes, but there are good people within it. They are trying their best. I think, you know, my role as a journalist can be to say, and a critic really, and a pop culture observer can be to say, I have watched this over time also. It's not you it's the system and that really is kind of like the subtext of my book my advice to young people entering the industry is that every single day you're in this industry you deserve to be treated fairly and paid fairly and when that doesn't happen if you can't make change with your allies with your guild with whoever you want to work with if you want to do something like that you don't have to because sometimes you might not be in a position to take any kind of a stand then you might need to just move on people who do a good job of leading a set, running a show, running a post team. Like there are so many people who do it well. They are the people who I have also watched thrive. This is this is my big 
challenge to the industry. I have watched people thrive and actually ascend levels in their career because they're great to work for or they're good to work for. You know, one of the things that I loved about your book, and I, I loved reading your book, by the way, I, I don't mean to fangirl all over you, but I will. Please, no, let's extend this portion of the talk. <laughs> I loved at the end where you try to come up with solutions and ways to not solve the problem, but just apologize or like find some kind of healing. And I thought that that was so important and it's done in such a thoughtful way. And maybe you can kind of touch on that a little bit because I think it's so important because it is easy. And I mean, I think we've all been guilty of just being like, yes, this sucks. This is terrible. That's terrible, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, there comes a point where, yes, we can talk about it. And I think talking about it is so important because it needs to be said. But now it's about solving problems instead of just bitching about them. So I loved at the end of your book, you included that. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be wonderful. I'll just, I'll give you a little snapshot into that. You know, Melinda Shue Taylor has been a showrunner, really been through the industry ringer in terms of the gauntlet that women of color are especially put through. Like so many other people I know um, came out the other side a better person, more determined to be giving, respectful and collaborative and accountable. Um, so that's possible. The week that the Lost excerpt came out in Vanity Fair was the, like an insane, intense week for me. But we were all, myself, Javier Grigio, Mark Swatch, who was also in the book, we were all at the ATX TV festival and I, you know, I hung out with them at different times and Melinda and I talked that weekend a lot, you know, just off the record, just like having a drink and whatever. And she said this, I think during a panel, so I feel okay repeating it, but she, she, she said, I get to say that that happened. It's not like it's over. It's not forever done, but they felt like the world understood what they'd been through and they didn't have to hide it. So that's, that's one step of healing. I think let the truth come out. It's why I was so glad to talk to, you know, Rabbi Dania Ruttenberg, her book on repentance, I think is amazing and so instructive for me. There is a process of repentance. There is a process of atonement. And if you're being like, that's all too woke, then, you know, Maimonides, a 13th century Jewish writer is, I guess, like woke. I don't know. Like this is the stuff that's been in many wisdom traditions for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Go to the party that was injured and make them whole if you can, if they're willing to be part of that interaction. Acknowledge to them and possibly to the world or the community what you did. And I, I felt that was so healing for me to do that. Because it's like, okay, well, so many stories that myself or other people did, okay, that person got fired. Now what? Well, now what means if I were some of these big time people that still were sitting on a pile of money, I'd give money back to the community. I'd give opportunities to the community. If Louis C.K. started a foundation to help female and non-binary comics and he didn't administer it, they got the money and they gave out the money and had they put on the festival. Okay, like, I don't know if that makes up for what he did to those people. It's That's not up to me. Those people are the ones who get to have a say about what they think is appropriate amends. There are steps that can be taken. I think in this community in particular, the first step that has to be taken, one of the first, creativity is not keeping people awake and on their feet 18 hours a day, running around at your every whim. Creativity is not abusing people in every single way. Well, he didn't, he's not a Weinstein. I don't know, like the, I, people say that to me and I'm like, I genuinely, like it stops my brain. I'm like, I don't, <laughs> I think that that's the part where if people are not willing to get with the program, there just has to be strong action taken. Prove that you're one of the good ones by doing these steps of atonement and giving back in ways that show that you are an accountable, respectful, and giving member of this community. If you have the power to use and you don't yeah. put skin in the game to make it better for other people, I don't want to hear about how you're one of the good ones. Yeah, sometimes you have to risk something to help people. The writers and the actors had to take this step because asking nicely in this industry, nine times out of 10, does not work. Everybody is doing the one job that they have and they're doing it as best they can. And the people with power don't have the time or the interest in in establishing those guardrails. 
no. and everyone's just working together to make this show, to make this film, to do the best that they can with what they have to get through it and then hopefully get hired on the next one. Everybody knows that HR is not there for, for the people. They're there for the, to protect the company. So like, wh- that's not a guardrail. Honestly, the media is HR. I want to keep everybody's eyes on the prize, which is the people who have the power are the ones that can make the change. Yes, guilds can band together and demand change. Yes, workers can band together and go to the press. They shouldn't have to. Well, Mo, I I can't tell you how grateful we are to have had this time to talk to you and to learn about your background, about your experiences. I said this to you before, but we really want to encourage young women to be in this industry because we do love it, but we couldn't in good conscience say, hey, be in this industry, but hey, just kidding, because it sucks. So, (laughs) I mean, I, I, I love this. Change isn't made in pushing one button. It's a lot of things. Culturally, you're helping to change the conversation. You're helping to change expectations. And that is incredibly important. So thank you for having me. It's a a pleasure. Tell our listeners where they can get your book. Well, my website, moryan.com, has links to all the stuff. You can find it on all the book selling platforms. On Twitter, yes, I'm still on the hell side that I will not call the new name, (laughs) moryan66. I'm on Instagram under the same handle. In terms of things I have coming, people are like, when are you going to write a sequel to Burn It Down? I'm like... That book almost killed me. Can I please write about something else? So I I hope to have another interesting nonfiction book for everybody in a couple of years. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm still active online and yelling about stuff. And I think I will have a new story for you coming out soon. So uh, watch my socials and see what happens. If you're interested in learning more about 101, check out our website, www.101podcast.com. Follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, all at 101podcast. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.